just before I do, um, it's just nice to say thanks for having me back. It's always nice to talk to Ayosh. I always think you're a very friendly, welcoming group. And of course, you know, you get it. So a lot of the basics I don't need to go through because, you know, I'm preaching to the perverted, as it were. So that will save us a little bit of time. Right, I'm going to try and share the screen and hopefully you'll see what you need to see. Uh, Mike, can you let me know? Is that OK? Yes, that looks fine. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. OK, right. So uh, I'm going to aim for this to come in under 45 minutes. Do feel free to speed me up and move me along. Um, I'm more than happy for people to ask questions as we go along. So, uh, Mike, you, if you're happy to watch the chat bar, because I don't think I can see that whilst doing my that's, thing. That's, um, that's fine, but and it works best as a dialogue, so please feel free to ask as we go along. There's no need to wait until the end. Right, okay, so um, let's crack on. So um, I was wanting to call it Who's Zooming Who? One for the kids there in the room. Um, but Zoom is gonna be a part of what we're talking about, Zoom fatigue, and the idea that we've all been working harder than ever before since lockdown, and now this period of hybrid or agile working so i'll come on to that and it's impossible to do that without talking about the ubiquitous zoom and zooming so the real title for this is really about fatigue working after the lockdown um and it really irks me how people keep saying post pandemic we're not post pandemic yet we're still in the thick of it we're still in it up to our hips so if i accidentally do say post pandemic i do of course mean post lockdown um, and the reason we've got the lamp there on the right hand side of the screen is that many historians and scholars think that it all started going wrong for us with the invention of the oil whale lamp. Because as soon as the oil whale lamp came out and people started hunting down whales in large um, numbers, particularly the right whale, uh, no, no relation, Mike, it's the right whale, R-I-G-H-T, because it was the right whale to hunt, the right whale, that was killed for its blubber and its oil, which then powered lamps. What does this mean? Well, of course, that was the dawn of shift working. Up until those days, we all had to work by the light of the sun and sleep by the light of the silvery moon. But once we had access to oil lamps, then shift working came along and human and data was changed forever. And some experts have said, we've never really got back to where we were before the advent of shift working. We'd quite happily evolved along for many, many thousands and thousands of years. And then all of a sudden, some bright spark said that you need to work shifts. It's a massive change. And have we ever really recovered? Okay, so as we trundle along, Couple of quotes for you. I always find it's good to quote the great Aristotle. All work absorbs and distracts the mind. He's not wrong. Um, and of course, we know in IOSH that, that work is good for you. It's good to take your mind off your problems at home. And it's brilliant to hear about other problems as well. So we all know generally the principle is let's keep people at work because it keeps them healthy and happy and distracted, as long as, of course, that work is good work and not bad work. Another useful quote is that from Ogden Nash, people who work sitting down generally get paid more than people who work standing up, and it just shows the inherent unfairness of work organizations. And then finally, a great quote from Malcolm J. Harrington, I'm sure you all dig this, Workers' health is worse at the end of a shift than it was at the start. There's something wrong with our organization. And I'd go further to say there's something wrong with our organization on both moral and legal grounds. So what are we going to talk about? So I want to talk about the impacts of fatigue because I think it is a very much overlooked condition. It's something that we have a very strange attitude to in the world of work. It's seen in some cases as a, as a badge of honor. It's seen as an indication that you're earning your paycheck, when really it's none of those things. Fatigue is a symptom of something not quite quite right in the workplace, whether it's an acute problem or it's a long term problem. But a fatigued workforce is not a good, happy, 
healthy or productive workforce. We'll talk a little bit about, about why we don't seem to learn the lessons of fatigue, and we'll talk about uh, Zoom fatigue and how to manage it. Now, I, again, as I said, a lot of you have already got this under your belt and we're, we're from the same hymn book here. When we're talking about fatigue, two main types you want to focus on, psychological fatigue and physical fatigue. And as the names imply, psychological fatigue is about tiredness, slowed reactions, poor decision making, slow, muddied thought, confusion. And physical fatigue, obviously, is about physical symptoms, listlessness, sleepiness, somatic symptoms that develop uh, relative to the physical um, fatigue. These are essentially two sides of the same coin. And we know through the biopsychosocial model, if you are psychologically fatigued, you will be physically fatigued and vice versa. And it's really a question of what comes first and the other will then follow. And we wanna focus on the fact that there is acute fatigue, short-term tiredness brought about through, you know, overwork or burning the candle at both ends or periods of intolerable stress and strain. And we've got chronic fatigue. Now we're not talking about chronic fatigue syndrome. We're not talking about myalgic encephalomyelitis or chronic fatigue, different kettle of fish for a different lecture, for a different day. What we mean by chronic fatigue here is periods of fatigue and tiredness that have gone on for six months or more, then you would be classed as having chronic fatigue, but it's not chronic fatigue syndrome. Okay, just checking that we've all got that quite clear. We also wanna focus on things like microsleeps. Um, and we've all been there, and some of you may be there right now, that horrible feeling where you are nodding off, and you know you're nodding off, and there's nothing you can do. You might try and fight it off and keep your eyes open or, you know, move your fingers and wiggle your toes, but you can't beat it. It will get you, and, it, you know, we've done it. I've, as a young person, living life to the full, I remember nodding off whilst driving my poxy little Renault Clio home from work we've all done it in meetings um, and no judgment if it's happening to you right now and you can see there that we got uh, Boris Johnson and Joe Biden happily having a little micro sleep at the COP20 summit a few weeks ago. I became interested in this because I did some research into pilots particularly pilots of budget airlines um, and if you nod off for one second of a micro sleep for one second and you're traveling at about 450 knots in your little um, Airbus, then that's going to be about 730 feet travelled whilst you're having a, a one second micro sleep. Now, clearly, that's really important for safety, critical, and transport sectors. Um, but it's not good if your staff are micro sleeping. We might joke about it, but it's a serious symptom. If your staff are nodding off in meetings, they are tired. They are not. Um, getting enough recovery time. So it's one of those little little signs and symptoms that we probably just joke about, but really it's a good clue and a good cue to have a conversation with a member of staff about workload and tiredness and are they getting enough rest. Before we go any further about measuring fatigue, um, it's worth remembering what our Victorian forebears used to say. They had a really good idea that the working day or that the day should be broken up into eight hours of work, quite rightly, followed by eight hours of uh, sleep and somewhere in between eight hours of, dare we say, leisure. So think of that balance. If you think of the work of the day broken up into eight hours of work, eight hours of leisure and eight hours of sleep. That was great for our Victorian forebears. I don't think we're there now. Many of us, particularly blue collar occupations, will probably spend more than eight hours working, especially if you factor in commuting and travel times. And where do we pay for it? Well, probably with the leisure time or with the sleeping. I can't see the room. I don't know if anyone else can see the room, but are we able to have a quick show of hands or hands up? How many people in this room would say, being honest, how many in the room would say that you get enough sleep on a daily basis? Is there any way of showing hands or? Uh... Oh, Andy, Andy, Zohaib. I don't know if you can count how many hands that we get there. Mike. Yeah. yeah we got on. thumbs up as well. There's a lot of hands. But we don't get enough sleep. We are we are a sleep deprived society. A good 10 hours for many people is a thing of dreams, no pun intended. Um, 
And we're going to say, well, is this part of modern life? Is this modernity? Whatever the cause is, fatigue is because your body is not getting enough rest and it's doing too much work. So what I've got on screen here is the CFS 11, the shoulder fatigue scale 11, okay? It's not the chronic fatigue scale 11, so it doesn't measure chronic fatigue, it measures acute fatigue. But if you give it to someone six months apart and they are symptomatic, they score above a threshold, you could argue there is an element of chronicity to their fatigue. I wanna talk about this uh, a little more because it is, for, for my money, the best scale for measuring fatigue. And it's 11 items, 11 questions, and it can be completed by an individual or it can be completed as part of a clinical uh, assessment or an interview. It's very simple to do, it's one side of paper. It's both useful as a clinical tool to aid conversations about what it is that's causing someone to be fatigued and how fatigued they may be. But it's also great in terms of research. And when I've done fatigue audits of organizations or well-being audits, I've always used this and it is great because it, it asks straightforward questions in straightforward language. It's got ecological validity, it's got face validity, and it correlates very, very well, very highly with other measures such as mental health or, or physical well-being. So it's a cracking little tool. I'll show you how to score it in a little while. Um, if it's okay, Mike, with you, I'll send around an article afterwards that shows you how to score it and gives you a little bit more detail if people want to use it, and I'll circulate a copy of the actual item itself. Yeah. Um, great, we'll move on to the next slide where you can see it in more detail, but I definitely recommend this. So you can see the preamble at the top, asking how you've been feeling over the last few weeks and questions one through to, let's say one through to, actually it should be that, that dotted red line should be um, after question seven. So forget the dotted red line. Questions one through to seven are about physical fatigue and questions eight through to 11, the last four questions measure psychological fatigue. And you can see that the response scale, the four columns where people tick, become more symptomatic as you move to the right of the screen. So let me just show you how it's scored. You can see there with questions one through to seven, physical fatigue, the least symptomatic answer is the green column, followed by the yellow column, followed by the orange and the red. So the further right we are, the more symptomatic we are. The first really helpful, straightforward way to score this scale is the binary scoring method. So with each item, if somebody ticks something in the green or yellow column, they get a zero. If they tick the orange or the red column, they score a one. And you can see with that scoring system, the minimum score someone could get would be 11 lots of zero, and the maximum would be 11 lots of one. And if someone gets a score of four or more, they're classed as fatigued. So the caseness threshold is four or above, and three or less, you are not fatigued. And that's a great way to have a good conversation with someone saying, well, your self-completion you know, your, your self questionnaire suggests that you are suffering from fatigue right now and, and away you go, you can explore it. The linear scoring method is much better for research or if you're doing an audit of an organization or a workforce because it's, it's got a linear scoring and it's gonna hope to be normally distributed. So again, if we look at the questions, the answers going from green, yellow, orange, and red become more symptomatic. And this time you can see we score with a zero, a one, a two, or a three. There's no cutoff on this. It's just to measure the distribution of scoring from a minimum of zero all the way up to a maximum of 33. Most organizations will be more or less normally distributed, but you will find a slight bulge towards the right-hand side, which strangely we call it skewing to the left, with a slightly more fatigued rather than a, a non-fatigued um, sample of a population. And you can see there with the, um, linear system, you also get a physical fatigue score and an independent psychological fatigue score. And if I just show you the next slide, um, this was something we did looking at the budget airline pilots I mentioned a few years ago. And you can see going up the left here, we've got physical fatigue scores and along the bottom, we've got the psychological fatigue. And you can see how pretty strong they correlate. There's a couple of odd bods there, 
But generally, if you're physically fatigued, you're going to be psychologically fatigued and vice versa. Um, this is a really interesting tool. We used it with a, a group of budget airline pilots and we got this published in Occupational Medicine. Um, we did it with pilots from a number of budget airlines, um, but it certainly rattled the CEO of one high profile budget airline who didn't like our article in Occupational Medicine and took exception to it and accused us of just doing a bit of rubbishy internet based research. At which point I said, if you give us 20 grand, we'll do a really good fatigue audit of your pilots and you put the phone down on me, which is a shame because that could have been some really good research. So what happens if your staff are fatigued? Well, there are a lot of problems, whether you're safety critical or office based, um, you've got problems with poorer vigilance amongst staff, poorer judgment making. They make judgments too quickly with uh, not enough data and they tend to make poorer judgments when they do. They're indifferent to safety. They're indifferent to poorer performance in themselves and other people as well. They're also more likely to take greater risks and tolerate greater risks in other people. And interestingly, some other research has found that fatigued people are more likely to suffer vocal hygiene problems, maybe because they're talking too much or having to raise their voice or shout or making umpteen phone calls and over communicating. Either way, the good thing with fatigue is it's gradual and cumulative. It can be spotted and it can be spotted and an intervention can be put in place before it gets too late. Hi, I know we're um, going to wait till the end, but there is one question looking to jump in if we can. Please. Uh, which says, which kind of fatigue do you think affects the work the most? Yeah. Uh, ooh, depends what sector you're in. I would certainly say acute fatigue is probably worse because it has an impact that is noticeable by yourself and others. By the time you get to chronic fatigue, you've already made adaptions and it's like people have got used to operating under a fatigued state. So um, I'll give you an example of some cases later on, but they, they adapt to this fatigued working and fatigued living, and it becomes almost like an, a tolerable second nature. So I would certainly say as, as individual suffering goes, acute fatigue is much worse because it's more noticeable and has a bigger impact on the individual. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And we have this idea that, that fatigue is a badge of honor if you're not tired you're not doing your job properly you know uh, uh, and people who get fatigued might be lacking resilience or they're weak or you need to send them on resilience training to make them more fatigue tolerant i think all of those are really dangerous attitudes to have there is no reason why your job seven and a half eight hours or a 12 hour shift should give you fatigue that that means you can't recover from your working pattern and some say, well, nobody gets enough sleep these days. We're all sleep deprived. You know, the good stuff doesn't come on till 11 o'clock at night. And you have to leave the house at seven o'clock in the morning because we have the worst public transportation system in Europe. And it, it, it's part of modernity. Uh, I think we had a, a graphic just then. Yeah, there we go. You know, if you want to get anywhere in this country, you have to get up extra early. At the moment in Birmingham, we've got a... a a congestion charge for large pollution emitting vehicles, which is great. We've just had snow this week and the trams aren't running. If you want to get anywhere for a nine o'clock start, you have to be getting up at the crack of the crack of five or six to get anywhere. So it's a particular problem in the UK because of our over, overburdened and terrible transportation system. So what the fatigued workforces look like? Well, generally unengaged. Um, I see so many companies that do staff engagement surveys and they have really poor data and they ask me, why are our staff so disengaged? We're doing everything. We're having former Olympians come and do fitness clinics. We're having yoga classes. We have an app. We have all sorts. Why are staff still fatigued? And the short answer is you're going to get poor engagement when people are tired. It's a bit of a chicken and egg but you can throw all the apps and all the sunny Sally Gunnels you want at your workforce. But if they are tired and clapped out, how do you expect them to take an interest in anything like yoga? So they will be more prone to accidents 
incidents near misses. We know they take more short-term sickness and long-term sickness. They have a, a greater resistance to new ideas and new ways of working. So they have poor adaptation skills because adaptation and change takes energy and enthusiasm and they just might not have it. Increased levels of staff turnover. And we have reduced workability. Um, I don't know if workability is still a thing in IOSH, but this was the concept that Yao Neil Marinen came up with a few years ago, where every worker has an amount of workability in them that you can measure. That's partly to do with their physical and mental state. It's partly to do with energy and attitude and their skills. And we all have a workability score. Well, people who are fatigued generally do poorer on the Ilmarin and workability scale. Organizational cynicism is something else. I find in many organizations, staff are so tired and, and, and done in that any new intervention or idea or any new drive from management is just met with apathy and cynicism. Um, and I think cynicism is one of the big cardinal symptoms of a fatigued workforce. And it is really hard to combat no matter how much energy or enthusiasm management have, it's very difficult to beat organizational cynicism. So fatigue, again, is a real fundamental root problem that you need to deal with in workforces. Well, all of these things on this list won't help. It doesn't matter how much training you've had, how many years experience you've had, how much caffeine you take, drugs, how much stamina you've got, how much jogging you do. None of this will help you beat fatigue it will catch up with you. And we know that age is a factor. And again, speaking to lots of pilots, when they were young pilots, they were flying lots of sectors and enjoying the um, glamorous benefits of pilot life as young pilots. Once they hit their forties, all they seem to want to do is chase sleep when they're not flying. And even when they're flying, they still try and sleep as well. Our little study of budget airline pilots found that eight out of 10 pilots are fatigued when they're flying. Eight out of 10 budget airline pilots feel that they are fatigued when they're flying, not because of the amount of sectors they fly, but because they are flying often in their discretionary emergency flight time, just to keep up with the uh, rosters they've been given. So nothing really beats fatigue other than rest and not being um, worked and strained beyond your capacity. NASA's 10-year AMES program, and more recently, um, um, Qantas's and then New Zealand have done some really good research looking at allowing pilots to self-roster, letting pilots pick the flight rosters that suit them. We know that some people are owls and some people are larks, and getting an owl to work at the time of a lark or getting a lark to work at the time of an owl usually doesn't work very well. Oh, we got a hand up. Is that a hand up or is that a residual hand from earlier, from Zahab? I've just spotted a hand, but it might be uh, uh, left over. No, I can see a question, sorry, rather than a hand. Okay. Oh, if you've got a question, go for it. Is there any, are there any indicators for fatigue in this slide? I'm not sure I get the question. Any no. indicators for fatigue? Yeah, I, I, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll pick that one for the end, end of yeah, the session. No worries. <laughs> Can do. Fine. Um, just a little thing on the lark and the owl. One of the problems we have with psychology time and again is it always relies on binary distinctions. You're either extrovert or introvert. You're either phlegmatic or not. You're either dead or alive. Psychology, unfortunately, has always gone on these binary differentiations. You know, people aren't 100% larks and 100% owls. There is room for middle ground, but often the way psychology is measured, it's just easy to say you're one or the other. So there is, obviously there is room for people to be uh, in the middle ground. You don't just have to be a, a night owl or a morning person. Craig, coach just ask. Uh, yeah. Uh, Claire Warman's asked, how much impact do you see when clocks change and we lose an hour's sleep? Yeah, I think there's an acute, I think there's an acute effect of that. Um, more when it goes forward in the spring rather than when it goes back in the winter. I think on both occasions, the biggest effect you see is confusion. Um, and when it does go 
back in the winter, of course, I think more people feel down because it's suddenly got darker earlier. And I think people also have concerns about their own safety when they're now out and about commuting when last week it was light, it's now dark. I don't think there are any major impacts in terms of fatigue, both acute and chronic. It's more to do with psychological adjustment and getting used to it now being dark when it was light. I think when we spring forward, of course, and the lights get uh, the evenings get lighter. I genuinely believe there is more of a, a you know a psychological relief at that, and that's probably going back you know uh, several decades to when we had daylight savings time brought in. I personally am of the belief that we don't need to change the clocks anymore in winter. It was originally done you know uh, 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 in terms of safety and kids out on the street. You know, given that kids don't really walk home as much as they used to in the good old days do we really need to 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 mess about with the clocks so i don't think there's any impact in term of in terms of fatigue i think it's just more psychological adaptation to being messed about again and having to change the clock on your cooker and the clock in your car i think it's more an inconvenience for some people okay right um, ah, now, if you want to, you can go to Metro Naps and spend £2,000 on one of these pods. This chap is called Marcus, and he will happily sell you one of these for a couple of grand. And you can lay in the pod with your feet up, and you can plug in an iPad, and it plays whale music and lots of blinky lights. Wonderful. And many student unions have bought these for their students. Um, but you can do the same thing with two chairs pushed together in a day room. I did some research a few years ago with night nurses in Denmark um, and we looked at the impact of having an 18 minute a 1 8 18 minute nap on your shift just in a day room with a couple of chairs pushed together and lo and behold we found that the nurses that use the 18 minute app felt much more refreshed and recovered from their night shifts more quickly than nurses that stayed awake and went straight through Kind of straightforward, really. So you can spend money on things like Metronaps if you want, but you really don't need to. But of course, it gives a very good message to your workforce if you're willing to, to spend that kind of money on them feeling better. Well, what about deploying folk? Well, look, this is the uh, uh, the Tower of Babel painted by Pierre Bruel. And you can see here, I don't know if any of you are biblical scholars in the room, but it's a wonderful painting. This is because King Nimrod essentially wanted to talk to God and he decided he needed to build a really tall tower so that he could get up into the heavens and tell God a few home truths. The problem was, as you can already see in this painting, that King Nimrod needed all the contractors from all over the world, so Syrian plumbers, um, 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 I don't know, Byzantine plasterers, the sparks came from Macedonia. And the problem was they all spoke different languages and nothing quite worked. And the tower developed a wobble. And of course, before he got up to the heavens, the tower collapsed. And some biblical scholars say that, that God punished the hubris of King Nimrod by knocking over his tower. How dare he try and ascend the heavens to talk to God? But I think this is a really good metaphor for modern planning of major projects. Um, I'm not even going to mention HS2, okay, and all that's being done and won't be done. But generally, we never seem to learn from fatigue, either from critical incidents, particularly in safety critical and transport operations, or in less critical sectors such as retail or education or finance. As I said, it's not taken seriously. And if, if organisations do learn from fatigue, it seems to be done very slowly and after a critical incident has occurred. Shift working is a great example. We know that many people struggle with shift work and sometimes they self-select out of those, those industries. But the police is a great example. You know, I think most forces will still operate an eight hour rotating shift system. So you may do three weeks on earlies, 6 a.m. till 2 p.m. Then you do three weeks on days, 2 p.m. till 10 p.m. And then you rotate forward again to do another three weeks on nights, 10 p.m. till 6 a.m. The problem with that is just as your body is getting used to the change, and it takes about two to three weeks, just as your body is adjusting to this new way of operating, it's changed again. And it can be very, very difficult for people's stomachs and brains to catch up. And there are other bigger problems with shift working. Um, if you're working nights and there's a union meeting or a management meeting in the day or a training course, 
you're going to miss out on those vital meetings because obviously you're working nights. We know that the body doesn't like to digest food at night and eat at night. The body wants you to sleep. So we still have shift working. It's not going to be avoidable, but there certainly are right ways of doing shift working and less good ways of doing shift working. And many organizations don't listen to the research and they just plow on as they've always done. But we certainly know that people are able to work in shifts when they rotate forwards rather than rotating back. But I've seen some shocking shift systems, oil and gas example, 12 hours on, 12 hours off. So six o'clock in the morning till six o'clock at night, then you're off for 12 hours, back again at 6 a.m. the next day for four weeks nonstop, and in some cases, eight weeks nonstop. Eight weeks of 12 hour shifts without a day off. Um, Absolutely shocking, but I guess that's what oil workers sometimes get paid for. Okay, uh, so we also have this idea, of course, that people can work and produce in a linear fashion. That if you make 10 units in one hour, you'll make 100 units in 10 hours. But we know human frailty is more like this. Even though we understand that people tire and slack and go to the toilet and chat and gossip and go and stand by the water cooler, management and planners still have this idea um, of linearity. And I still see it in, in research contracts where the time of researchers is based on a linear fashion without factoring in that people need breaks and, and holidays and, and time away from projects. So that needs to be, I think, much more carefully factored in when we're planning major projects. Some examples, Wembley Stadium given to the Australian firm Multiplex in 2002, when Wembley was gonna be refurb, budgeted at 326 million pounds, came in at 730 million pounds and massively over, over, overdue. And what did Multiplex do? When they started running out of time and they were facing penalty clauses for not meeting certain milestones, they just drafted in more staff, just like King Nimrod. They brought in more chippies, more sparks, more plumbers, more software guys. They had them staying on site. They were living in porter cabins outside. And the problem was that the workers just got in the way of each other. The electricians couldn't do their jobs till the plasterers had done their jobs and vice versa. So throwing more labor at the problem is very rarely the solution. But this is what we still see hundreds and hundreds of years after King Nimrod made the same mistake. British Library was the same thing. The Scottish Assembly, not factoring in the natural delays caused by the human body and its limitations in terms of workload. Um, again, we're not gonna mention HS2, it, it, it's too obvious, um, but people don't seem to learn the human fatigue frailty game. So what have we got in the post lockdown era? So we have many organizations that have moved to working from home where possible. Now I'm talking about England here, but we know that different parts of the UK have done things differently. Certainly we were told in March in the university sector, that's it, no more campus teaching. You've suddenly got to turn all your lectures into video lectures and we'll come back to that later. And um, no face-to-face -face working, it's all gonna be done by Zoom or Teams. And whilst that was met with great relief and people thought, great, no commuting, I'm saving a fortune, it quickly became apparent in the university sector that this meant more work than ever before and different kinds of working and different kinds of skills. And other organizations, as we know, essential businesses had to carry on as normal with increased worries about infections, reduced public transport to meet those needs, increased anxiety and nervousness amongst some workforces and some groups. So it's had a massive impact whichever way organizations have chosen to meet lockdown requirements. So I wanna focus on agile working or hybrid working. This is this idea that it's a blend of working at home when you can, but going into your HQ when you need to for face-to-face -face work or meetings or client work. And the time is split around what your duties actually are. So I guess to give you an example with the university sector, how we currently work at the moment is that all of our lectures have been recorded and students watch those lectures online at a time that's suitable for them, but they will come onto campus for a two hour seminar a week later to talk about 
the lecture and I go onto campus, room full of students, and we have this two hour seminar, and then I clear off campus and go on and work from home again until the next seminar. Um, it's been really difficult, I think, for, for staff to get used to home working. And although it was seen as a big giggle and a DOS, um, it can be really confusing. I think more, more people have been doing more work. And I think there was a, a couple of initial surveys, initially American data, but also UK data, that showed on average UK staff during the lockdown were doing 20 minutes extra work a day compared with before the lockdown. And that adds up obviously to, to over an hour um, each week, which might not sound enough, a lot, but there's a cumulative basis to it. Many people felt the need to cram in more meetings to justify that although they were at work at home, they were still working. People were having back-to-back -back meetings without breaks between them. The meetings were intruding into home life. You know, we've certainly got the idea of people's backgrounds. I don't particularly feel comfortable with people at work or my boss or whatever, seeing what I've got on my uh, kitchen wall or, or my background. You know, the psychological contract is there to, to give you a little bit of privacy. Um, people were spending excessive time staring at screens with poor postures, working at kitchen tables or with trays on their knee. People didn't have suitable workspaces at home and there are issues of privacy. Um, how do you have meetings, sensitive meetings, when you've got kids running around and dogs coming into the room? And all this was being done whilst home life, life in the home continues around you. I certainly think it has been a more tiring time for people doing hybrid working than it was when they spent the full working day uh, in, in their office or their workplace. Very briefly, I want to show another scale to you. This is the life events inventory. And I think it's really important because if you want to see how tired your staff are, you have to acknowledge the holistic worker. And a lot of the problems you have at home will be bleeding now into your work. So a few weeks ago, I had a leaky roof, storm, leaky roof, and I was trying to do my work around waiting for a plumber to come and then the plumber was doing the work and the roof was doing the work. It's very difficult to maintain professional distance and be professional whilst you've got lots of workmen in the house doing stuff. So I would certainly suggest the life events inventory, although it's getting on a little bit and it's a little bit out of date, it does give a good measure of all the sources of strain, both domestic, professional um, and personal that can be impacting upon the worker. Now, here's a case I want to show you. Um, this is Lucy. He's a 31 year old college tutor full time. And this is her current working pattern. So on the timetable there, she has to get into work to start uh, teaching at 9 a.m. on a Monday. It goes right through till 1 p.m. without a break. An hour off at 2 p.m., then another two hour teaching slot and then free to go home. The next day, back in at the crack of 11, but it's expected that they will do some working at home before commuting in. They teach right through from 11 till three, they have a two hour break and then they've got this terrible one hour slot. And then the rest of the week, they can work at home and they're expected to do meetings and, and, and other such stuff in, in this role. This was for a 12 week run. And by week four, signs of fatigue were showing, particularly on Monday nights and Tuesday nights, and it really took Lucy, I think she said, for the rest of the week. It was, wasn't until Friday that she felt she'd recovered from the Monday, Tuesday. Now, we know that many people do enjoy compressed working time. Um, you know, it's more convenient for them. But this isn't really compressed working time. Cramming all of the teaching, the face-to-face -face teaching into two days, long days without sufficient breaks, isn't compressed working time. Um, and as the weeks went on, Lucy said that she started to feel anxiety, dreaded going in on Monday mornings. She developed a rash all over her body. She developed respiratory problems. And to be absolutely honest, at some point with this case, I thought this sounds more like long COVID. This might not be acute fatigue or work-related stress. This sounds a little bit like long COVID. Um, and the inevitable happened. I think this member of staff, she took two sickness absence spells throughout the 12 week period I think around week nine no around week eight and week 10 so two periods where she was too poorly to go in and teach 
and it was the symptoms from fatigue and tiredness and worry that, that caused her to be off. Um, so just an example of how hybrid working might be great for some, it's not for others. And the irony is with this case, Lucy said that she was really looking forward to this, this working arrangement. She thought getting all of her teaching done in the first two days would leave her three days where she could enjoy her other stuff. But it turned out, um, big mistake. She was too fatigued to enjoy the rest of her working week. We've got to talk about long COVID at this point, and it's worth knowing that NICE have just issued new guidance on long COVID uh, spotting, treatment, management, etc. So it's worth looking at the NICE guidelines. We've got a big problem, I think, with long COVID in that it's not going to, I don't think it gets taken seriously, particularly in the absence of someone not suffering from COVID originally or acute COVID or not knowing they had COVID. And many people who've developed long COVID type symptoms weren't aware of contracting COVID originally. So we have this very strange, it almost to me feels a little bit, a little bit like Gulf War syndrome. We have a very strange mishmash of psychological and physical symptoms, but in all, we don't have in all cases a physiological cause or, or um, a known cause. Some people knew they had COVID, others suspected it, others weren't even aware. So I am very worried that this is, this is gonna be viewed by some workplaces as a form of um, Gulf War syndrome. And also it's got an awful lot in common with chronic fatigue syndrome, myalgic encephalitis, if you will, the, the classic chronic fatigue syndrome. And I do worry if many workers who come down with these symptoms may not be spotted, may not be treated seriously, and it may be, you know, thrown in the dustbin diagnosis. You know, many people who believe that chronic fatigue syndrome has psychological or behavioral etiology, I think many managers will think the same thing about those who've got long COVID, especially in the absence of an original COVID case earlier on down the line. So I think it's just worth at this, worth at this stage just being aware that if you've got long COVID type symptoms in a worker, do take it seriously, do use occupational physicians, occupational medicine referrals to try and manage it and spot it and rule it out if that's possible. But that's just my little suggestion at this stage, but it is very confusing with long COVID. A little bit more about sleep disturbance again. We know that when people are fatigued, it doesn't mean that they are so fatigued they sleep. The irony is that many people are so fatigued that they can't sleep. They're worried about their workload or not coping. They worry about how it will look that they can't do their job and they worry about perceptions and blame. So the irony is that those people who are acutely fatigued don't get the sleep that they need and they will be even worse during the working day. There may also be those people who've got sleep apnea, usually with a collar size above 17 and a half, who may go on to develop sleep apnea and more acute fatigue because they're not getting enough sleep. Um, I don't want to focus too much on, on the European perspective, enough to say that, that we used to have more full-time workers than any other country in Europe, and we had more part-time workers doing more hours than any other country in Europe. That has now changed, partially because of the European Working Time Directive from years ago. I think many organisations are being very flexible they are allowing staff to um, have breaks and to have recovery time, doing phased return to the workplace. So many organizations that use hybrid working are certainly not demanding staff come back in five days a week. They're taking it quite slowly. They're offering hot desk working where possible, IT support so that people can work in a clever mobile way. So there is lots of really good practice out there. I'm glad to say my university is doing some really good stuff in terms of um, working patterns and letting staff choose what works best for them. I mentioned earlier about recording video lectures. Well, this is uh, someone I know from another university. Uh, we're calling him Larry. And like my university, uh, he was forced to turn all of his lectures into online lectures when lockdown occurred in March the other year. And for every two hour video lecture that they needed to make, it took Larry five hours of recording and editing and changing their lecture slides and notes. So if they were having to make two two hour uh, videos, it was taking them 20 hours of production time each week. That's pretty much just over half of Larry's working contract. Another problem was Larry wasn't able to record his video lectures in his kitchen because he had two small kids, a partner, 
and dogs and cats, and there was no quiet time. Um, he was forced to stay up late and record his video lectures after midnight when everyone was asleep and the house was quiet. So we often, when we talk about working from home, we don't think about the difficulties. And when you have government ministers and prime ministers uh, and, and chancellors saying that people who work from home have been dossing and it's about time we drag them back into, into the workplace, it's quite insulting. Um, other little niggles that have happened that, that can really impact on staff. Uh, you know, if you're hybrid working and you're going in for a two hour meeting in the afternoon, you get to work and you find all the parking spaces have gone because you're not getting there early in the morning, getting the space. And I know these are only little things, but we know that it's the little things that start to cause the bigger problems in workplace psychology. So although organizations are trying to do their best to accommodate everybody in the most flexible way they can, there are always gonna be problems with how that's, that's implemented on the ground. So let's talk about Zoom, that ubiquitous, horrible verb of Zooming somebody. What we saw is that many people were going back to back meetings, not enough breaks, too much time sat at the desk, trying to squeeze too much in and losing their work life balance. Just as a quick show of hands, uh, how many people in the room would say that, that Zoom meetings have become something to dread? Not this meeting, of course, but generally, do you dread having to meet people in Zoom? or teams quite a few i don't know if you know how many you've got there mike hang on we've got my video says five at the moment but i'm sure it's more wow maybe people are so zoom fatigued they can't even <laughs> raise their zoom hands <laughs> well here's a case look and again, it, it, I think it might be tempting to trivialize things, and moan about snowflakes and so forth. But I, I, I witnessed this with my own eyes as well. But this is a commercial researcher, 28 year old Sarah. She has social anxiety, which many people do. Uh, and she preferred when she was in large Zoom meetings to just be audio without being video. A senior male staff member insisted that in, in meetings that he chaired, Everybody who's speaking should be video on. And if your video isn't on, you can't contribute to the meeting. And I think this awful phrase, no face, no space. And nobody dared challenge that. And I think that's an absolutely appalling way to run video meetings. There was no guidance or policy in the organization about whether you have to appear on camera. Um, it was suggested that if you don't appear on camera with clients, it doesn't look professional and it could be damaging. But there was no um, um, policy saying you do or don't have to. Um, Sarah didn't feel confident to appear on video. She also said that personally it took about an hour to do her makeup. She didn't want to appear on video conferencing without makeup. And if she'd been doing workouts or walking the dog before a meeting, she did not then want to go straight into a meeting where she looked sweaty and a mess. Now, a lot of people who met this were, were quite trivializing of it, but I think it's really important that if people have to be in video meetings, in meetings, they should not be forced to be on video when they don't want to be. Um, but many organizations didn't come up with guidance or policies in time. And I think in, in Sarah's case, she felt she couldn't make input. She didn't like speaking up in meetings. She was there, but she was disengaged and didn't feel present in the meeting. So that's one I think for leadership to tackle as well. Okay, look, Zoom fatigue, this is great. Five reasons why using Zoom fatigues you. Too much eye contact. Making eye contact with people is psychologically intensive and tiring. Um, when you're in the real world, studies have shown you don't make that much eye contact. But when you are on Zoom, unfortunately, your eyes are drawn to, the, to, to making eye contact with those on screen. It's psychologically intense and tiring. Also, constantly looking at yourself. Constantly looking at yourself is also tiring. If you had someone following you around all day, with a mirror making you look at yourself, you become self-conscious and it's quite tiring. So again, seeing yourself on screen is a very irritating thing. Video chats means you're stuck on the screen, you're not getting up to go to the loo or you're not getting up to make a cup of tea or stretch your legs. It involves people being stuck at a desk in what might be an unhealthy posture. The cognitive load is also higher in video meetings. 
telephone calls, you can do other things, you can doodle, you can read a book while you're talking to someone. It's very hard to do that when you're in this intensive video box. And um, sorry for the typo there at the bottom on number five, but some research has shown that video meetings take longer than real world meetings. And there was a really nice piece of research over the summer that showed that Zoom meetings or video meetings that were chaired by women, or if the people in the, in the group, the majority were women, those meetings tended to go on longer than meetings chaired by men, because some women felt more social pressure to make more chit chat or small talk or have more how are you moments in conversations, whereas males might approach things differently and have more of a perfunctory role. So we're not exactly sure why, but the data suggests that, that Zoom meetings with majority females or female chairs have more of a caring, how are you, how are you getting on, what's it like being you attitude, and that takes additional time. Okay, we're nearly, nearly done. I would certainly recommend having a look at this paper. Again, Mike, I'll send this to you, but this is a really nice paper that has developed a Zoom fatigue questionnaire. It takes less than two minutes to complete, and it measures how much Zoom fatigue you feel. It measures fatigue on these five different ratings, emotional, motivational, visual, social, and general fatigue. And I think here I've got a list of the questions, but I'll send you the link to the actual uh, online survey if anybody would like to do it. It's, it's very illuminating. Um, and again, you can you answer it with typical Likert scale responses. It tells you what percentile you are in, in terms of how fatigued you are, and what are the aspects of video meetings that actually make you individually more fatigued. So if that's okay with you, Mike, I'll send that paper through to you afterwards and the link and people can measure their own Zoom exhaustion levels. Um, I'm just whip through this quickly and finish. Compassion fatigue is another kind of fatigue we often think about. Um, we get fed up of hearing other people's problems and their difficulties. And the best way through compassion fatigue is um, social support, peer supervision, compassionate management, being able to let off when you need to, being able to reflect when you can. So compassion fatigue is a different kind of fatigue, but always worth mentioning. And again, social support, whether it's uniform services or police, um, social support is really good at reducing things like mental health problems, acute mental health, acute fatigue. Knowing that other people are fatigued and it's not just you can be helpful up to a point, up to a point, but really after that, you need to tackle the real causes of the fatigue. And again, you probably don't need to know this, but it's always worth mentioning occupational health physicians. This is something they can deal in. Again, we still have this, this idea in workforces, don't we, that occupational health is there to weed you out and fire you for being inherently bad at your job. It's not there at all for that. We all know that. But many folk, many working folk, do not know that occupational health and occupational health and safety staff see fatigue as the, the hazard it is and try to do something about it. So it's always worth getting, as you know, uh, occupational health and health and safety staff involved. The worst thing managers can do is come up with informal arrangements. No point having informal arrangements. They'll always come back and bite you on the bum at a later date. Get occupational health professionals like yourselves involved at earlier dates. So I will just finish by saying, you know, the, the WHO said that COVID-19 is pretty much here to stay. The best thing we can do is change our working behavior and working will never be the same for quite some time. And the sooner we get our heads around that, the easier it will be for us to adapt. I've been moaning for years about adapting the four day week. I constantly witter on about half day closing when I was a small boy. And I tell students about half day closing and they have no idea what half day closing was. They, why would they? They're used to 24 seven, seven days a week. If we broke, broke back half day closing and everything shut at 12 on a Wednesday, the loss of productivity will be more than made up for by reduced costs of occupational health, by reduced sickness, by happier, more loyal, more engaged workforces. So bringing back the four day week, which I see there's massive movement for it now. I think people have had a taste for a change and some organizations are being incredibly groovy about the four day week, about working from home. We've seen some big blue chip companies saying that, that staff should be free to road to how they want to work. And I think that really is enough from me.
Okay. Craig, thank you. Let me you give you so your much. screen back. Okay. Pleasure. Thank Let you. me give you your screen back to you. Okay. Can you have you got your screen back? Am I still yeah, yeah, no, you're fine. Craig, thank Good. you for that. Excellent. I don't I don't know about anybody else, but I'm I thoroughly enjoyed that. Uh, as always. There are, I think, some final questions. Bear with me. I had it a minute ago. Tom, have you got the chat up, mate? There's, um... I got it. Yeah, there's yep. quite a few. There are some. There's quite a few just coming, but so suddenly I've just lost them all. <laughs> uh, I got a few here. Oh, okay, uh, right. Yeah. Can fatigue be considered as a work risk? I think that's from Zahab. Yeah, absolutely, it can. Uh, particularly in safety critical you know we've seen it with trains and planes and also with automobiles people staying up all night online or you know watching netflix when they should be sleeping and the next day at work they're just slow reaction time poor um, choice reaction time poor decision making so uh yeah worker fatigue is a serious risk absolutely um you know it's both a symptom and a hazard uh, what training or practices do you recommend to overcome fatigue in the workplace Look, having a nap um, whenever you mention this and say, look, we said this, when people are coming back from lockdown, not to be working people eight hours solid, let staff have a nap. Let staff have a 20 minute window where they can have an 18 minute nap. The amount of resistance from your average daily mail reader saying that this is ridiculous. This is why Britain's going to the dogs. How, how is Argos going to operate if half the staff clear off another you know, mid afternoon nap? It can be done. It's not impossible to do. It's not a question of working your staff into the ground or them being slackers. There is that healthy middle zone. If organisations allow staff to have a power nap, and the clue is in the name, they will see staff can go longer with fewer problems. Um, what training or practices do you recommend to overcome fatigue? Yeah, did that. What extent is a direct link between increased fatigue and long-term adverse effects on general health? Well, we know that people who spend most of their time fatigued have poorer quality of life. Um, I think they do have reduced lifespan. We've certainly seen this in Japanese samples where they have, you know, a working week in, that can be in excess of 50 hours. We know about Karoshi and, you know, um, about 300 people a year die in Japan from Karoshi, which is more or less a cardiovascular collapse brought about through intense overwork and not enough rest. Um, the, the health effects tend to be secondary though. So if you're spending all your time working and you're too tired to go down the gym or you're too tired to go and buy some fresh food, we see that people tend to eat more poorly. They don't get enough exercise. They don't do enough self-care and then they'll be susceptible to secondary health problems. We certainly found that with shift workers. You know, people who tend to work nights eat a pretty bad diet because the facilities aren't available to them to eat healthily. They miss healthcare appointments in the day because the, you know, the world is arranged diurnally and they can't fit in with it. So many long-term health effects tend to be secondary to the lifestyle that the fatigue person is going to end up living. Is there anything permanent fatigue? Uh, permanent fatigue? I don't know. I can give you an example. My mum, God bless her, she spent 35 years, 38 years of her life working as, a, as an auxiliary nurse on nights. And for every week of her life, she worked three night shifts, 7 a.m. Uh, 7 p.m. till 7 a.m. And it made her the most um, grumpy, grumpy, miserable bugger you have ever met because she just could not get enough sleep during the day. She's trying to sleep when the sun is shining and everybody's making a noise and cars are revving and the kids are running around the house. I think that kind of permanent night shift did have a massive impact on her psychological well-being and her quality of life and happiness. Um, again, whether we say it's a long-term adverse effect or a behavioral effect, I certainly would think that most organizations now that have permanent night shifts will go the extra mile to try and help their staff a little better than they used to. Uh, Claire, as the last one here from Claire, it says, I work for a global organization and we need to have meetings with North America, Japan, Australia. So the time zones are spread through the day. We had a discussion this week about trying to move meetings to suit people's times. The Japanese guys specifically asked us to put meetings in the evening for them, including their Friday evening. We're trying to help them, but they don't really want us to change. Uh, well, Japan is a wonderful working culture all of itself. Um, the Japanese guys, uh, what kind of sector is it, Claire? Are you able to say? 
Have we still got Claire? Yeah. It's a really good question. It's a great question. Hi, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Hi, Claire. Um, I work for Cardo, so we, um, we, we're constructing um, robotic warehousing in uh, Japan at the moment. Mm. How about that for... <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. I mean, without making a sweeping statement about the Japanese, of course, they have a very rigid business culture. And without going on too much, um, most Japanese salarymen will again be on roughly 40 hour weeks, but it's seen to be very bad form if you actually work to your contracted hours. Uh, and many organizations will softly expect workers to put in 50 or 60 or even 70 hour weeks. Taking annual leave is often frowned upon and it's seen as being disloyal, not that they get much annual leave anyway. Um, so if they're wanting you to put meetings in the evenings for them, you mean in your evening to accommodate them or their evenings to accommodate you? No, it's, it's their evenings, but we sometimes put them in our evenings, which means that they're we're getting their mornings as well. So they're starting early and finishing late and working all the way in between. And we don't think it's right. And we're trying to stop it, but they're actually they're actually specifically asking us to, to put certain times. And because Australia moan more, so the Australian meetings who actually finish who are a little bit further behind, they actually we actually do those earlier. So the Japan yeah. ones in their time zones are even later. I mean, my understanding of Japanese work culture is you could go as late as you want with them and they will see that as reasonable and acceptable. And that, that's not a, you know, that's not a racist trope about, you know, Japanese and politeness, but it is, it, it is all about getting the job done. Your worker well-being pretty much comes second in Japan behind getting the job done sufficiently. So I would imagine they will be quite adaptable to any time you or Australia may suggest. You would probably get the better out of them in the morning than you would at the end of the day when they're likely to be fatigued and tired. Um, but I, 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 I had a trip to Japan once and a very, very short, short story. Um, my guide took me to the top of a, of a building at 10 o'clock on a Wednesday night. 10 o'clock, 10 p.m. on a Wednesday night. We we're on top of the building and across from us was a Japanese commercial bank. And at 10 o'clock, all the lights went out in the offices because they're on timers. And very quickly, all the lights came back on again. And these were, these were office workers who were still in the office at 10 o'clock at night. They were just, you know, nine to five office workers, perfectly happy, when we say happy, perfectly acceptable working beyond five o'clock up till 10 o'clock at night. And even when the building lights go out automatically, because obviously Japan is on mostly on nuclear power to, 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 to save power, the lights go out. The office workers all started turning the lights on again. Rather than going home, which is a hint, they turn lights on and carry on working past 10 o'clock. And I was absolutely amazed by this, but my dad said, that is Japan. That is what you are dealing with. Their culture is work first, die second. I've got a wonderful book all about Koroshi um, that was translated from a Japanese version. Um, Koroshi is an absolutely fascinating condition. Um, and it, it actually, it's down to about 250 to 280 deaths a year in Japan. And the Japanese Ministry of Labor now see it as a compensatable um, condition. And when somebody dies through cardiovascular collapse and overwork, and it's predominantly males, Relatives, I think, can get up to something like 75,000 yen in compensation, which isn't a great deal. But the Japanese Ministry of Labor admit that it is now a compensatable workplace death. Um, so you, you might want to think about um, um, uh, what gives you advantage in those arrangements for timing, I would suspect. But you could suggest three o'clock in the morning, and I imagine that they would be happy with that as well. Well, yeah, that's we, Japanese we working culture. Yeah, we, we literally have it in our risk assessments because of Karoshi. Say again, sorry. We actually have it in our risk assessments of Karoshi because, because it's such a risk in Japan. And, that, and the problem is that they suffer from fatigue. And so we are trying to deal with the fatigue issues and they are just, it, it's a real cultural challenge. So, Absolutely. Well, if it's any use, I've got a link to... 
I can send you a link to a lecture I do about Karoshi and, and you'll see that it, it's, it's exported from Japan now. It's happened in Korea, it's happened in Indonesia, where Japanese business practices have sort of infected other countries. And I'll, I'll send you, um, Mike, if I send it to you, could you pass yeah. that on to Claire? Uh, yes, and if anybody if anybody's in the LinkedIn page, we'll put uh, any respective links that Craig sends onto the LinkedIn page as well. All right. That sounds any, really interesting, Claire. Thanks. Any other questions off the floor? We're off the Zoom, as we've got to say. Okay. Like Angela's point there. I can't see that, actually. I think it's over to you with that, Craig. I think you're picking them up now. Uh, Angela Roberts says, I used to work for Honda. And the Japanese guys would tell stories of hiding in cupboards to hide from the people who go around to check for people working too late. <laughs> yes, and, and, and Angie, you probably got all the stories about the Kanban truck as well and the exercises at the beginning of the day. Uh, brilliant, good stuff. Thank you. Okay. There's one, one last question, sorry, if we just quickly got time for it, which just says, um, from your statement, um, can they extract that in order to overcome fatigue, one needs to take at least hour, at least eight hours of sleep. Is that the only way um, cause out of work fatigue? Good question. It's not a hard eight hours. Some people need a little less sleep. We know as you get older, you need less sleep. And when you're younger, you tend to need more sleep. It's relative to how much working you're doing. So if you're working eight hours, you would imagine eight hours might be okay. If you're working 10 hours, you might need more than eight and you're going to have to rob that eight from your leisure time. So it really comes down to flexibility and, and individual differences. But splitting it eight, eight, eight is an easy way to do it if, if doable. The trick is, I would always say, is trying to cut down on your commute time. Um, it's avoiding that long one hour, two hour commute because that commuting eats into your leisure time or your sleeping time. We know some people get by on four, five or six hours, but it really comes down to what you need. Some people are heavy sleepers. The other issue, of course, is the quality of sleep that you get. You might get a good solid 10 hours. Good luck to you if you do. But what's the quality of that sleep? If you're sleeping next to someone who's tossing and turning and you don't get into any deep REM sleep, then you're not going to be suitably refreshed. So it's not just about the length of the sleep, but it's about the quality and how much restful sleep you get as well. Okay. Craig, thank you ever so much. Brilliant, mate. Well done. Thank you. No, thanks for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Shall I disappear and leave you all to your IOSH business now? Uh, yes, I think, I think we're all done on the question front, aren't we? Great. Yeah. Well, look, I'll send you those links. Uh, and if anyone's got any questions afterwards, if they want to email me, I'm more than, than happy to help if I can. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks, thanks, Craig. thanks for having me. Thank you. I hope it wasn't too fatiguing. No. Cheerio. <laughs> Bye-bye. Okay. I um, hope everybody enjoyed that. Um, I certainly did. Um, just before we wrap up the meetings, and uh, once again, as Roger said, apologies for the late, the late start, and thank you for sticking around. For those that have been to meetings and are familiar with our Winterfest theme, based on the current regime that I have got with how we're doing face-to-face -face meetings, obviously that's not going to happen for a December meeting, but it's something we are looking at for, we have to plan a sort of quarterly process at the moment. So at this moment in time, we are looking and hopeful that we might do a Winterfest style meeting out and about in Fe at February's meeting, but we will keep you updated with that. So that will be hopefully be a face-to-face offsite for the day in February, the 3rd of February, but we will keep you posted with that. Okay, Roger. Right, yeah, um, I shall wrap this one up. First of all, thanks to Mike for Mike Wright for organising this, and if he can pass on our thanks again to Craig Jackson for for the for the session, which as somebody just said, really informative, great session, so that worked really well. Thank you to the branch committee as well for supporting it. Um, apologies once again for the problems we had at the start and thank you for for hanging around and, and being able to join in as it went through don't forget when you've done after you've done this at some point go online go on to your cpd record it record your thoughts on this what you got out of it what you didn't 
what else you might want to do with it as you go forwards. Um, all the links that we've got coming out of this as well, so the survey um, and, and other bits and pieces, anything like that, we will be putting on the branch LinkedIn page. So you'll be able to, to do some follow-up looking, either, either assessing your own fatigue or members of your family or colleagues or, or whatever, um, and seeing how it impacts and what else you might be able to do with it. Um, so thank you again. Uh, meeting is now drawn to a close. If committee can stay, oh, Alan. Could I, uh, hi, Roger, I could ask you a quick question, please. I've dropped you an email a couple of weeks ago, but I don't know if you've received it in this fact, might be. I've just asked if there's any feedback from the Privy Council regarding the grade changes. Um, there, I'll, I'll sort, I'll, I'll, I've missed your email, sorry for that, um, but what I'll do is I'll look up, there are some changes, it's, yeah. it's a bit complicated to go into now, basically yeah, it doesn't like change, but there are some changes to the way it goes, so I'll send it back to you and then we'll also put that information on a link on the LinkedIn page. That's great, thank you very much Roger, I appreciate that, thanks no Mike. No worries, thanks Alan. Otherwise, thank you very much. See you at the next one. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Point. Bye. Let me see hang around. Yep. Uh, hi. Um, hi, Roger. Just very quickly, I did send you a private message. I didn't know if you get it. It's Mark Elton. It was just exp an expression of interest about joining the committee. Obviously not for here. If there's any feedback, you could let me, if you could let right. me know. Um, I've changed, I changed jobs recently and all my emails went mad. Okay. <laughs> so, um, what, can, you, can you send me a quick email again, roger.smith at me.com and I'll, roj.smith at me.com and I'll get back to you. rojsmith. Dot smith at me.com. Me.com, yeah. Me, me yeah. Perfect, okay, I'll drop that to you then, no problem. Thanks a lot. Take care, stay safe, everyone. Cheers, bye-bye, bye-bye, bye-bye. Thank you. Okay. Allowed to just disconnect the others, do we now? Uh, yeah, I'm just uh, in the house. Yeah, you can re you can remove the others now, Mike. Yeah, I've just removed a few.